Okay, so we're, uh, tonight's meeting is going to be on uh, dementia, and uh, it's an important topic, and glad to have you all. And uh, as usual, we're kind of curious if there are any new members that want to kind of speak up and say how you found out about today's or these sessions. Um, we're just kind of curious about that. Anybody new? I don't see anybody raising their hand or unmuting themselves. So, oh, so Heather says I'm new, but having audio issues. Oh, okay. So, so welcome. You can type in the chat how you heard about the classes, Heather. And uh, while Heather's working on that, I've got a little story to tell. I went to a dermatologist I'd not been to before. Uh, I think his name is uh, Benjamin Vasquez. Um, I had a little thing that I wanted him to check on. And um, I said, but the main reason I'm here is not for that issue, but it's to tell you about these classes that are for free for you know, we that you could encourage your patients to come to and uh, they could get support and helping to transition to healthier lifestyle choices. And here's a brochure. Here's a couple of them with the Eugene plant-based providers. There's over 45 people now. And um, so he's reading through the uh, advertisement that Scott put together. And um, he gets to the bottom and he points his finger at the bottom of the list of diabetes and heart trouble and kidney trouble. And he says, you left off psoriasis. He says, you left off acne, and hydradenitis suppurativa. So here is the dermatologist who's telling me about the skin conditions that have been helped by dietary changes. And uh, needless to say, I was very, very excited and thrilled. Uh, he was a new doctor I'd never met before. And so I suspect there's a few more like him in this community who haven't quite touched bases with, but yet who do have an understanding and would likely be supportive of what we're trying to accomplish here. Great. I think I have autoimmune disease on there. I guess I don't. I don't know if I do. I think I do. <laughs> <laughs> that that encompasses psoriasis anyway. But <laughs> it was pretty cute as he went down trying to go through in his mind what things were missing from that list. That yeah, would be <laughs> definitely not an exhaustive, history. not an exhaustive list. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, I took it as he is very supportive. That's great. Uh, so Heather, there's a little microphone at the bottom of your screen. There you go. Yeah, uh, I just had to enable permissions for Zoom to use my mic and then it was taking too long to get it to reload. So that's why I typed it in chat. Everything's all set now, but I learned about the session from Scott, uh, mm. like on there. Yep. Hi. Hi. So hi. I finally made it to one. All right. Welcome. Thanks. Yeah, we're happy to have you. Uh, anybody else uh, who's new to the classes or who wants to speak up about some issue that went on in their life that they were, you know, either excited about or that they're having some issue, problem with, that's what we're here for. Any thoughts from anybody? I don't see a lot, but uh, we'll kind of uh, go ahead and get started. With we have a book for tonight I can show. Okay, go ahead and share what uh, you want to share, and then we'll go ahead and play a few videos. Yeah, I'll show the go to the website here real quick. Uh, get this 
Let me get this down. There we go. Back up. Ah, why doesn't that go away? There we go. Let this back up. And then go to resources, and you can hover and go over to books. So the books for classes. So I have one for for Alzheimer's and dementia. Scroll down and there we go. Alzheimer's disease and dementia class, Alzheimer's solution, D Dr. Dean and Aisha Shirzai. They're a married couple. They're both neurologists. They do research on Alzheimer's and uh, it's a really, really good book. Real nuts to bolts on not just Alzheimer's, but mild cognitive impairment all the way through all the different kinds of dementia. So that's really, really, really good. So recommend that highly. Again, in all the books that, and all the resources we have on the website, we don't have any financial ties to any of it. It's just, just uh, the resources we trust in and we've read and we use and recommend to patients. Check that one out. Thanks, Scott. Joan? Uh, go ahead and unmute first. Uh, there you go. About, about that book, um, does it deal with caregiver or just the patient? Um, yeah, I don't think it, yeah, not really. I mean, there's definitely insight on, on that behavior, but it's not, yeah, it's not designed to be a kind of a preparatory guide for someone that's dealing with someone with Alzheimer's. It's more about what are the causes, what are the, the, the diet, diet and lifestyle factors that contribute to it and, and how do you, how can you address it more, more like that's more of the focus. Do you know of any, um, books to recommend that are for the caregiver? I don't, I don't specifically, I know they have programs. I know that I've seen, seen on the news resources in the community there where they will teach class, you know, do classes for people that are, that are, do, are having to be caregivers for people with dementia. I have seen that, but through, I don't know if it was through LCC or just seen that in the community, you might Google that uh, area resources for taking care of dementia patients or Alzheimer's patients. Okay, thanks. Good, good question. There are a number of books. If you uh, do a search on dementia caregiver books, uh, there's a whole listing of them. Um, and um, just too numerous to count, pretty much. OK, um, any other questions or thoughts? Okay, well, in that case, we're gonna go ahead with first video and then I'll, I'll share my screen. Uh, and then this first one is only a minute and then we're gonna listen to Dr. Neil Bernard, Barnard uh, as kind of the next step. So here's the first one on brain health. As you can see from that video, this is a uh, pretty uh, important topic to cover. It's a lot of people who are eventually who, who are candidates for developing dementia, one disease that we none of us probably wish on ourselves or anyone else, even our worst enemy. Uh, you wouldn't want them to have this problem. 
So let's listen to what uh, Dr. Neil Barnard has to say. Uh, he's always fun to listen to. It's a bit longer video, so try to hang in there a little bit. It's, you know, 17 minutes, but I think it's worth, worth the time. And uh, I hope you feel it is also. Thank you for joining me. On February 8th, 2012, my father passed away. And the truth is, that was the day his heart stopped beating. For all intents and purposes, my father had died years earlier. It started with memory lapses, and as time went on, his memory failed more and more, and it got to the point where he didn't know his own kids who came in to see him. And his personality changed, and his ability to take care of himself was completely gone. And if you could make a list of all the things that could ever happen to you, the very last thing on your list, the very bottom of the list, the thing you want the least is Alzheimer's disease. Because when you lose your memory, you lose everything. You lose everyone who ever mattered to you. And if you could look into the brain of a person who's got this disease, what you see is between the brain cells are these unusual looking structures, beta amyloid protein comes out of the cells and it accumulates in these little sort of meatball-like structures that are in front of you on a microscopic slide. And they shouldn't be there and they're a hallmark of Alzheimer's disease. And this disease affects about half of Americans by their mid-80s. And you could say to your doctor, okay, I don't want that. Uh, what can I do to stop that? And your doctor will say, well, it's old age and it's genetics. There's a gene. It's called the ApoE Epsilon 4 allele. And if you've got this gene from one parent, your risk is tripled. If you got it from both parents, your risk is 10 to 15 times higher than it was before. What's the answer? Get new parents? No, I don't think so. There's, that's not it. So I'm sorry. It's old age. It's genes, period. That's it. There's not a darn thing you can do. Just wait for it to happen. Or maybe not. In Chicago, researchers started something called the Chicago Health and Aging Project. And what they did was they looked at what people in Chicago were eating. They did very careful dietary records in hundreds and hundreds of people. And then they started to see who, as the years go by, stayed mentally clear and who developed dementia. And the first thing they keyed in on was something that I knew about as a kid growing up in Fargo, North Dakota. My mom had five kids. We would run down to the kitchen to the smell of bacon. And my mom would take a fork and she'd stick it into the frying pan and pull the hot bacon strips out and put them on a paper towel to cool down. And when all the bacon was out of the pan, she would carefully lift up that hot pan and pour the grease into a jar to save it. That's good bacon grease. You don't want to lose that. And my mother would take that jar and she would put it not in the refrigerator, but she put it on the shelf because my mother knew that as bacon grease cools down, what happens to it? It, it solidifies. And that's the fact that it's solid at room temperature is a sign that bacon grease is loaded with saturated fat, bad fat. We've known for a long time that that raises cholesterol and there's a lot of it in bacon grease. And, and by the way, the next day she would spoon it back into the frying pan and fry eggs in it. It's amazing any of her children live to adulthood, but that's the way we live. Now, the number one source of saturated fat is actually not bacon. It's dairy products, cheese and milk and so forth, and meat is number two. And in Chicago, some people ate relatively little saturated fat, around 13 grams a day, and others ate about twice that much. And the researchers just looked at who developed Alzheimer's disease. And can I show you the figures? Here's the low group, and there's the high group. In other words, if you were avoiding the bad fat, your risk was pretty low. But if you were tucking into the cheese and the bacon strips, your risk was two, three, or, or more fold higher. And then they looked not just at saturated fat, they looked at the fat that's in donuts and pastries. And you know what that is, that trans fats, you'll see it on the labels. And they found the very same pattern there too. So the people who tended to avoid the saturated fat and the trans fats we want to avoid them for cholesterol and heart disease reasons, but they also seem to affect the brain.
Then researchers in Finland said, wait a minute, let's go further. There is a condition we call mild cognitive impairment. You're still yourself, you're managing your checkbook, you're driving, your friends know it's you, but you're having mental lapses, especially for names and for words. And they brought in over a thousand adults, they were 50 years old, and they looked at their diets. And then as time went on, they looked to see who developed mild cognitive impairment. Now, some of these people ate relatively little fat, some people ate a fair amount, and then they looked at whose memory started to fail. And they found exactly the same pattern. In other words, it's not just, will I get Alzheimer's disease, but will I just have old age memory problems? Well, what about that gene? that ApoE Epsilon 4 allele, the one that condemns you to Alzheimer's disease. Well, they then redid the study, and they focused only on those people. And some of these people ate relatively little fat, some people ate more, and exactly the same. In other words, if you are avoiding the bad fats, even if you have the gene, your risk of developing memory problems was cut by 80%. And this is my most important point. Genes are not destiny. Now let's take another look in those plaques. We know there's beta amyloid protein, but there's also iron and copper. Metals in my brain? <laughs> That's right. There are metals in foods that get into the brain. Now think about this. I have a cast iron pan, and we had a backyard barbecue, and a week later I remember, oh, I left my fry pan on the picnic table. It rained last week. What happened to my pan? It rusted, and that rust is oxidation. Or you take a shiny new penny, and does it stay shiny forever? No, it oxidizes too. Well, iron and copper oxidize in your body. And oh. as they do that, they cause the production of what are called free radicals. You've heard of free radicals. The free radicals are molecules that are swimming around in your bloodstream, and they get into the brain, and they act like sparks that singe through the connections between one cell and the next. So how is this happening? Where am I getting all this iron? Where am I getting all this copper? How can that be? Well, how many people have a cast iron pan? Let me see hands. Now, if that's your once a month pan, I'm going to say, who cares? But if it's every single day, you're getting the iron into your food, and it's more iron than your body needs. Or copper pipes? Who's got copper pipes? Well, the water sits in the copper pipes all night long, and in the morning it goes into the coffee maker, and you're drinking that copper, and you're getting more than you need, and it starts producing these free radicals that go to the brain. Now, if you're a meat eater, or especially liver, there's iron and copper in those foods too. And we used to think, isn't that great? Until we realized iron is a double-edged sword. You need a little bit, but if you have too much, it becomes toxic. Vitamins. Vitamin manufacturers put in vitamin A and the B vitamins and vitamin C and vitamin D, and then they throw in iron and copper, thinking, well, you need these, not recognizing you're already getting enough in foods, and if they add it to your supplement, you are getting too much. Okay, so what am I saying? What am I saying is, aside from the fact that the saturated fat and the trans fat will increase our risk, these metals will too, and they are causing sparks to form in the brain, free radicals to form, that sins through connections. And if that's the case, then I need a fire extinguisher. And we have one, and it's called vitamin E. Now, vitamin E is in spinach, and it's in mangoes, and it's especially in nuts and seeds. And in Chicago, some people eat a little bit of it, and some people eat a lot of it. And the beauty of this is vitamin E is an antioxidant. It knocks out free radicals. And so if what I'm saying is true, then the people in Chicago who ate only a little bit of vitamin E would be at much higher risk than people who ate a lot. And that's exactly what the research showed. People getting eight milligrams a day of vitamin E cut their risk of Alzheimer's by about half compared to people getting less than that. Hmm, okay, how do I get that? Well, it's very, very easy. Run to the store and just buy a bottle of vitamin E pills. No, I don't think so. And here's why not. Nature has eight forms of vitamin E that they build into, it's built into nuts and into seeds, but if I put it into my supplement pill, 
I can legally call it vitamin E if it has only one form. And if you're eating too much of one form of vitamin E, it reduces your absorption of all the others. So you want to get it from food. That's the form that nature has designed for us, and that's the form that we've evolved with. Okay. Now, we can go a step further. Oh, by the way, I forgot to tell you. How much should I have? If I put some nuts or seeds into the palm of my hand, by the time it hits your fingers, that's just one ounce. And that's about five milligrams of vitamin E right there. Now, the trick is... Don't eat it, because if you do, you know what happens if you have those nice salty almonds and you've eaten them? You fill your hand again, and then you eat it again. And there's something about salty cashews and almonds, is it just me? There's something about them, they're a little bit addicting in some way. So don't do that, that's going to be way more than you need. The answer is, pour them into your hand, and then crumble them up and put them on your salad, or put them on your oatmeal, or on your pancakes or something. Use them as a flavoring, not as a snack food, and there you're gonna be okay. All right, researchers at the University of Cincinnati went one step further. Not just saturated fat, not just trans fats, not just vitamin E, but they said, what about color? Look at blueberries and grapes. That, that color that they have is dramatic, and the colors of blueberries aren't just there to make them pretty. Those are called anthocyanins. They brought in a group of individuals into a research study. Average age, 78, and everyone was already having memory problems. And what they asked them to do was to have grape juice, a pint a day. A cup in the morning, a cup at night, okay. Three months later, they tested everyone and their memory was better and their recall was better. Three months? That sounds too easy, how can that be? Well, think about it. A grape has a rough life. A grape has to sit on the vine all day long under the sun and exposed to the elements and it has no protection. Or does it? That purple color, those anthocyanins, happen to be powerful antioxidants, just like vitamin E, but they're the grape form. And if you consume them, they go into your bloodstream. And if that's true, it doesn't have to be grapes. It could be anything that has that color, like blueberries. So back into the laboratory, a new group of patients, they came in, they all had memory problems, and three months on blueberry juice, their memory was better. Their recall was better. Now, the moral of the story is not to have grapes and blueberries and blueberry juice and grape juice. No, the answer is color. If you look at the colorful foods, there's an important lesson there for us. You walk into the grocery store, and from 100 feet away, looking at the produce department, you can recognize beta carotene, lycopene, anthocyanins. Your retina can detect them because that's the orange color of a carrot, or the red color of a tomato, or the purple color of a grape. And the brain also tells you they're pretty. They're attractive. You can recognize antioxidants, you're drawn to them. So back in 2009, my organization, the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine, went to the Department of Agriculture. And we said, this is important. Let's throw out the pyramid. The pyramid was a nice shape, but it had a meat group, and it had a dairy group, despite the fact that people who don't eat meat or dairy products happen to be healthier than people who eat them, and also, who eats off a pyramid anyway? We eat off a plate. So we devised a plate that said fruits and grains and legumes, that's the bean group, and vegetables, and those should be the staples. Well, we gave this to the USDA in 2009 and we, we didn't hear back from them. So, in 2011, we sued the federal government. The Physicians Committee filed a lawsuit against the USDA simply to compel response. And did you see what the US government came out with in 2011? I'm not taking any credit for this, but this is now U.S. government policy. It's called MyPlate, and it does look in some ways similar to what we'd sent them a couple of years earlier. Fruits and grains and vegetables, and they have this thing called the protein group. Now, the protein group could be meat, but it could be beans or tofu or nuts or anything that's high in protein. It doesn't have to be meat. In fact, there is no meat group anymore in federal guidelines. There's a dairy group there, but to their credit, Soy milk counts, so things are improving. Now, so far what we've talked about is getting away from the saturated fat that's in cheese and bacon and meats, getting away from the trans fats and snack foods, You're having the vitamin E and the colorful foods, and there's one more step. 
It's not all food. There's something to say about exercise. Uni at the University of Illinois, researchers brought in a large group of adults, 120 of them, and they said, a brisk walk, three times a week, and after a year, everyone went into the laboratory for a brain scan. And they measured the hippocampus, which is at the center of the brain, and it's the seat of memory. It decides what should be let through into memory and what, what should not be let through. And it turned out that this organ, which is gradually shrinking in older adults, suddenly stopped shrinking, and the exercisers found that their hippocampus was a little bit bigger and a little bit bigger, and a little bit bigger. It was as if time was going backwards. It reversed brain shrinkage, and on memory tests, they did substantially better. So I've devised my own exercise plan. I'd like to present it to you. I do this three times a week. Arrive at the airport as late as possible, <laughs> carry massively heavy luggage, and just run for the plane. <laughs> now, at the University of Illinois, they had their own ideas, and their idea was a little simpler. Do a 10-minute walk and do it three times a week. And then next week, let's do a 15-minute walk. And the week after that, 20. And all they did was add five minutes a week until they got to 40 minutes. And a 40-minute brisk walk, this is not a trudge, but it's a good brisk walk. 40 minutes three times a week is all you need to improve memory and reverse brain shrinkage. Very simple. Now, what I would like to do is to go back in time and I want to sit down with my dad, and I want to say, Dad, I found out something really important. We can change our diet. We don't really need that cheese and that bacon stuff. There's plenty of healthy things that we can eat. Let's bring in the colorful vegetables and fruits. Let's make them part of our everyday fare. Let's lace up our sneakers. Let's exercise together. It's too late for him. But it's not too late for you. It's not too late for me either. And if we take advantage of what we have now learned about how we can protect our brain, then perhaps families will be able to stay together a little bit longer. Thank you very much. Okay, I'm gonna stop the share uh, there and I'm gonna open this up to the gallery to see if there are any comments from anyone, see what your thoughts might be. Uh, yes, Joan. Uh, go ahead, and unmute yourself. And I was pleased to hear him say a brisk walk because that's so much better than feeling like I have to do something very aerobic, like a run, or a hard bike ride, or some of the messages I seem to be getting are, you know, it has to be very aerobic. But a brisk walk is doable, especially as we age. So from these classes, you're not hearing uh, an aerobic uh, exercise continually, are you? I, I haven't been sure of what to do. And that's the component I still need to put in my my overall plan is the exercise. Yeah, so in the blue zones, they're not necessarily running themselves into the ground uh, with marathon running. They are just moving throughout the day, uh, moving a lot, sitting less. And um, so I think you're getting the idea that Dr. Bernard uh, gave you that you don't have to run to the airplane every time you go to the airport. Just a, a brisk walk. Scott? Yeah, I was just showing the uh, extra on the lifestyle medicine pillars. Here's your lifestyle medicine activity. So th this is based on the science as far as preventing and treating chronic disease, the amount of, of uh, exercise that's needed and what, what, what examples of those are. So Here's moderate activity and vigorous activity. So you really only need, well, it's up to 60 minutes a day of moderate activity, 30 to 60 minutes, 30 is the minimum, 60 minutes is the kind of the, the maximum, but you get the most bang for your buck at 30 minutes a day, five days a week. So 150 minutes a week. And here's examples of moderate activity. So it's nothing that's super aerobic actually. And, uh, 
and it gives some more, more examples of it there. But uh, when, when it comes to if you want to do aerobic activity, that's for more if you want higher level cardiovascular fitness, more stamina, things like that, then it gets into the more uh, aerobic activities and, and whatnot. But the, you know, getting that 150 minutes of moderate activity a week or 75 minutes of vigorous activity gives you what, what we're talking about in these classes, which is, you know, we're trying to treat, prevent, reverse chronic disease. And that's, and that's there under the resources for the classes. Let me show you again, get this out of the way. Click here. So it's under, you click resources and then you go to handouts from classes. And then you scroll down, it's the, um, Lifestyle handout, nutrition to sleep, right here. You can get a one page summary of all of those. Thanks for sharing that. That's great. Yeah. John Lee. Hi. Hello. Uh, yeah. Uh, actually, I want to I want to thank you because of the video. It's very inspiring me. And uh, actually, I, I heard of the plan based like two weeks ago. Actually, I don't follow very much because my people around me they just maybe uh do they still do their own diet i feel like if i do the plant-based kind of it's different it's weird i feel like i need to breathe to do this and uh, after i hear that this kind of it's very healthy and very help your body to uh prevent all, all kinds of disease i feel like oh i probably need slowly uh transition to be like a plant-based <laughs> maybe <laughs> That's kind of want to say. Well, thanks for and sharing that. Yeah, and also I feel like maybe I need to do walk because it's harder to exercise and start walk. At least the movement, move. As it doesn't matter what the exercise you do, just to make your body move. It would help move a little bit every day. That would help a lot. Slowly would be better, I think. Otherwise, I want to say thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Glad you could make it to class tonight. Uh, yeah. Nikki. Um, you can go ahead and unmute. Thank, thank you. I am wondering what you might think, uh, know about Lewy body disease as compared to Alzheimer's. Uh, I know it has the proteins, um, and how much that could be affected by diet. Yeah, it's called Lewy body dementia, but yeah, I don't know if, as much about it as far as diet and lifestyle change, but it can't hurt because anything that's going to improve blood flow is going to improve brain function potentially. But as far mm -hmm. as if diet and lifestyle change would actually help dissolve or, or remove some of the Lewy bodies, I don't, I don't know the answer to that. Mm -hmm. I don't know either. Mm -hmm. And again, most of these problems are once you've been diagnosed or once a relative or friend or someone's been diagnosed, um, it's uh, awfully difficult to um, have any significant change. Uh, in other words, we're not gonna get reversal uh, is what uh, my take yeah. is. So the prevention is, is worth the pound of cure in this case. Well, right. I'm really excited to see the uh, results of Dr. Warnish's study. So. Uh, at the American College of Lifestyle Medicine Conference I'm going to at the end of this month in Denver, uh, Dean Orsh is going to be there and he's going to release the results of this, at least preliminary results of his randomized controlled trial. So he's, so not only did, first he did the randomized controlled trials showing reversal of heart disease, then he did one on reversal of early stage prostate cancer. Now he's doing a randomized controlled trial to see if the same diet and lifestyle changes can reverse early stage Alzheimer's. And uh, he's going to be at the conference at the end of this month and re release the results. So I'm excited to, I'll share that with everyone when I get back from that conference. Um, Dottie. For I, my other comment, Scott, I hope that we have a whole session where you can just go over everything you learn. Because <laughs> I think that's going to be amazing. So I don't know what's on the schedule, but I'm hoping you can just share all the stuff and we can go vicariously that way. What I was going to say about um, Dr. Barnhart's thing is that I had no idea about the iron and the copper. 
and being in supplements. And so, you know, I'm kind of got a bunch of supplements and I take them sometimes. So I'm going to definitely look through that. But I also have a cast iron skillet. I also have bought other um, newer pots and pans that are either um, ceramic, you know, uh, no Teflon now, whatever. So I'm thinking maybe I should get rid of my cast iron pan. So I don't know if there are any comments about what to do about that. But I I hadn't heard that. And I'm also wondering then how do we detox if we've had, if we've got too much iron and copper. Another one to throw in there is aluminum. There's some data on aluminum accumulation in the brain too. So trying to use, so trying to use a uh, uh, deodorant that doesn't have aluminum in it, one way to decrease aluminum in your exposure a lot of makeups and stuff too apparently have a lot of aluminum so it, so all the heavy metals but yeah i don't know as far as i guess what just by eating you know having healthy diet and lifestyle there's i know dr gregor's had some videos on on heavy metals and and that diet and lifestyle can help kind of help your liver get rid of more of it because you think about eating high fiber you're actually your liver is getting rid of all the toxins and metals and things like that. So you're more likely to get rid of more of it if you eat a high fiber diet because uh, you're going to expel more of it through your stool. We've personally stopped using our iron skillets after seeing some of these videos. Uh, just made the decision that um, we just don't want the extra iron. So that's a good point that you bring up. Uh, there may be some people who offer uh, chelation therapy. I don't know that that's been shown um, how effective it is, whether it really helps people. Um, I don't know a lot about chelation therapy. Um, so I guess I would wanna see some controlled, randomized controlled studies that show whether it's effective and can reduce it and, um, you know, you can do uh, studies of your iron levels to see whether they're high or low and see if it's even an issue uh, with the amount that you're using your pans. You know, you can talk to your doctor about that, getting a level. Joan. I unmuted this time. So, okay. so the I like the idea of the blueberry juice or the grape juice but what if you're dealing with a person that's got diabetes? Yeah, so what he was saying. Go ahead. Oh yeah. Scott. So what he was saying there is not to not to drink blueberry juice and grape juice and stuff, but to eat the colors of the rainbow. So he's like, because he, that because the reason they did they do things like powdered supplements of blueberry and and a pill or doing juice is because it's easy to do a randomized controlled trial that way. They use it for research. And so it's not the healthiest way to go. It's just a way to, cause they can do a grape juice and then do a grape juice flavored placebo. And then they can, then they can compare it. Is it, was it better than the placebo? So in studies it's that way, but yeah, you're, I'm glad you brought that up. Cause it's, it's not to drink the grape juice or the, or any of the juices. It's to eat blueberries and eat, you know, tomatoes and eat, you know, uh, peppers and all eat the colors of the rainbow from the produce aisle. Not, not the, processed juices and things like that yeah thanks you're absolutely right you want to eat the uh, food in its natural state with its fiber and you don't want to just drink the juice with the stripped out fiber now uh genes are not your destiny are you all good with that or do you have a problem with that because one of the uh, barriers to making healthy food choices is if you have a belief that your genes are going to determine whether you have a heart attack or whether you are going to have diabetes or heart trouble uh, or dementia, you may find yourself feeling helpless and hopeless because you have relatives who have these problems. And rather than focusing on the fact that their food choices and lifestyle choices are probably very similar to what your lifestyle choices have, are right now, and that it's the lifestyle change choices that are going to 
provide you with about 80% of your health. Uh, so try to um, knock that myth down for anyone who tries to tell you that it's your genes that are gonna determine your destiny. Um, did you hear the saturated and trans fat issue? Trans fats are kind of, I think they've been banned in our country starting soon. I don't know if the ban is start taken in, is in place now. It tends to prolong the shelf life of all the processed foods. Uh, so I don't think it's mu as much of an issue right now, but it's found in a lot of those packaged sweets and uh, foods that are so addicting. And the saturated fat issue uh, is a really big one that a lot of people don't understand still. And did you get the point about exercise in your hippocampus, a part of your brain that will shrink if you are sedentary? And so walking more, standing more, just adding more motion into your life will go a long way to helping your brain stay healthy. That was my take on his video. Any thoughts from anyone else? Gonna kind of I just thought it was amazing that by just doing that, you can increase the size of it. I mean, the body is like so miraculous. And, you know, that certainly is, I exercise every day, but not like, not, not I'm sure not enough. So uh, I felt more inspired to try doing some brisk walking after that, so. Well, thanks for sharing that. That uh, kind of gives us a little positive feedback that we should keep sharing these sorts of ideas with you. And we we try to look for, you know, videos and articles that will kind of inspire you a little bit to keep reaching for your health. Anyone else? Okay, we have Joan and then Heather. So Joan so, first, then Heather. I know that um, you're going to do a class on reading ingredients and labels, but do they have to label it as a trans fat on the um, label? Or do they just say they used, you know, corn oil or something? Yeah, so <clears throat> like Charlie was kind of alluding to there that because that video with, with uh, Neil Barner is kind of a little bit older. And so there are, the trans fats are outlawed. So there's no more no more trans fats in processed foods in America. It, most of the trans fats you'll get now, there is, are some natural trans fats in, in animal products, mostly in, in ruminants. So cow, if you have a rumen, so like cow, so uh, dairy and meat and things like that have a little bit of trans fat naturally. And so that's like the worst kind of fat. But you're, in general, you don't have to really worry about trans fat anymore. Heather. Okay. What I think is the article uh, that uh, Neil Barnard was referring to uh, about exercise and the uh, volume of the hippocampus improving with, with uh, moderate to 40 minutes of, of walking three times a week. Uh, I put that in the chat. I tend to look for all the articles. There, there is a, there, there are more recent studies, um, but they all seem to a line from a super quick review but it's a it's a pretty easy well i hope it's an approachable read um if folks are more interested but yeah if you all have a chance to check it out make sure it's the actual article oh, that would be awesome um same with some of the the earlier stuff when he was showing uh just the bar charts i because of work i kept looking for is it statistically significant or show me the source or something like that. So if you know any of the, the sources from the talk, um, I'd be very interested in reading more. Thanks. Great. Thanks for uh, sharing that article. I think that is probably one he is referring to. I don't 
I don't re recall actually looking at it, but I've come to trust Dr. Barnard. I've uh, been watching him for over 10 years now. Um, he's one of my mentors. Um, I ask medical students or anyone who attends these classes to find something wrong with uh, either Dr. Bernard's uh, site or information or Dr. Michael Greger's site at nutritionfacts.org. And I've yet to find anybody who has come up with anything of significance. So we're still waiting. So if you find something, we are definitely open to uh, discussing that further. Pull your camera down, Charlie. You're, you're only seeing the top of your head. Oh, okay. <laughs> I kind of am bouncing up and down tonight. Thanks. <laughs> uh, now we're going to go on to uh, uh, Michael Greger's site. So I'm going to share my screen with you again. Now, Michael Greger, if you look on his nutritionfacts.org, all these videos are on there. And he um, has all his references that are posted there so you can read the articles. Uh, if you've not been to his site, I think you'll be impressed with him. So what let's- What's that name again? What's that? Nutritionfacts.org. Thank you. Yeah. At the okay. bottom of the video, there's a transcript and you can see the uh, all this articles cited and all the references and everything in the in the transcript. So brain foods to fight aging. Let's just see what um, I think this is a writer video and we'll go from there. There's an extensive scientific literature describing the positive impact of dietary plant compounds on overall health and longevity. However, it's only now becoming clear that the consumption of diets rich in plant foods can influence neuroinflammation, brain inflammation, leading to the expression of cytoprotective, cell protective, and restorative proteins. Just over the last decade, remarkable progress has been made to realize that oxidative stress and chronic low-grade inflammation are major risk factors underlying brain aging. So no wonder antioxidant and anti-inflammatory foods may help. The brain is especially vulnerable to free radical attack oxidative stress due to its high fat content and its cauldron of high metabolic activity. Uh, you don't want your brains to go rancid, so you'd think one of the major fat-soluble dietary antioxidants like beta-carotene would step in. But the major carotenoid concentrated in the brain is actually lutein. Uh, the brain just preferentially sucks it up. For example, if you look at the oldest old, like in the Georgia Centenarian study, Recognizing that oxidation is involved in age-related cognitive decline, they figured dietary antioxidants may play a role in its prevention or delay, so they looked at eight different ones— vitamin A, vitamin E, on down the list— and only lutein was significantly related to better cognition. Uh, now, in this study, they looked at brain tissue on autopsy. By then, it's a little too late. So how could you study the effects of diet on the brain while you're still alive? I mean, if only. There was a way we could physically look into the living brain with our own two eyes. There is, with our own two eyes, the retina. The back of our eyeball is actually an extension of our central nervous system, an outpouching of the brain during development. And right in the middle, there's a spot. This is what the doctor sees when they look into your eye with that bright light. That spot, called the macula, is our HD camera where you get the highest resolution vision, and it's packed with lutein. And indeed, levels in the retina correspond to levels in the rest of your brain. So your eyes can be a window into your brain. So now we can finally do studies on live people to see if diet can affect lutein levels in the eyes, which reflects lutein levels in the brain, and see if that correlates with improvements in cognitive function. And indeed, Significant correlations exist between the amount of macular pigment—these plant pigments like lutein—in your eye and 
cognitive test scores. You can demonstrate this on functional MRI scans, suggesting lutein and a related plant pigment called zeaxanthin promote cognitive functioning in old age by enhancing neural efficiency, the efficiency by which our nerves communicate. Uh, like, check out this cool study on white matter integrity using something called the diffusion tensor imaging, uh, which provides unique insights into brain network connectivity, allowing you to follow the nerve tracks throughout the brain and researchers were able to show enhanced circuit integrity based on how much lutein and zeaxanthin they could see in people's eyes. Further evidence of a meaningful relationship between diet and integrity of our brains, particularly in regions vulnerable to age-related decline. So, uh, so do, do Alzheimer's patients have less of this macular pigment? significantly less lutein in their eyes, significantly less lutein in their blood, and a higher occurrence of macular degeneration where this pigment layer gets destroyed. The thickness of this plant pigment layer in your eyes can be measured and may be a potential marker for the beginnings of Alzheimer's. Well, let's not wait that long, though. We know macular pigment density is related to cognitive function in older people. What about during middle age? One apparent consequence of aging appears to be loss of some aspects of cognitive control, which starts out early, in mid-adulthood, but not in everybody, suggesting maybe something like diet could be driving some of the differences. Here's a measure of cognitive control, showing younger, on average, do better than older adults. But older adults who have high macular pigment, lots of lutein in the back of their eyes, do significantly better. These results suggest that the protective role of carotenoids like lutein within the brain may be evident during early and middle adulthood decades prior to the onset of more apparent cognitive decline later in life. You can take 20-year-olds and show superior auditory function in those with more macular pigment in their eyes. Uh, look, the auditory system, our hearing, like the rest of our central nervous system, is ultimately constructed and maintained by diet and is therefore not surprisingly sensitive to dietary intake throughout life, all the way back to childhood. Higher macular pigment is associated with higher academic achievement among school children. You can look into a kid's eyes and get some sense of how well they may do in subjects like math and writing. Uh, this is finding is important because macular lutein is modifiable and can be manipulated by dietary intake. OK, OK, so where is lutein found? The avocado and egg industries like to boast about how much of these macular pigments they have in their products, but the real superstars are dark green leafy vegetables. A half a cup of kale has 50 times more than an egg. A spinach salad or a 50-egg omelet? And the earlier, the better. Pregnant and breastfeeding women should definitely be checking off my daily dozen green servings, uh, but it's also apparently never too late. While some age-related cognitive decline is to be expected, these effects may be less pronounced among those eating more green and leafy. But you don't know for sure until you put it to the test, which we'll explore next. Okay, so that's one video by Gregor and how to prevent um, Alzheimer dementia with diet is our next video and then we'll stop and see what kind of questions you have. What is behind the dramatic increase in dementia in Japan over recent decades? Uh, maybe it's rising obesity rates, or the increases in cholesterol, saturated fat, and iron from increases in animal products and meat. Overall calories just went up about 10% in Japan, whereas animal fat and meat consumption rose 500%, about 10 times the rise in sugary junk. Now, during this time span, rice consumption went down, but the thinking is that rather than white rice somehow being protective, maybe they were just eating something worse instead. Uh, it's like when you, you know, find fish consumption is correlated with less disease. You wonder if it's because they're eating that rather than some worse meat. 
If you look across multiple countries, you see a similar pattern, with the most important dietary link to Alzheimer's appearing to be meat consumption with eggs and high-fat dairy also may be contributing. Uh, there appears to be a really tight correlation between Alzheimer's and per capita meat supply. And then studies within countries uncover similar findings with Alzheimer's and cognitive decline associated with meaty, sweety, fatty diets, whereas most plant foods were associated with risk reduction. Um, this could be for a variety of reasons. Animal products tend to have more copper, mercury, lead, cadmium, no folate, but contain saturated fat and cholesterol, and pro-inflammatory advanced glycation end products. So many mechanisms that dietary modification may be our best bet for reducing risk of Alzheimer's disease. But how do we know its cause and effect? The evidence that meat consumption is causally linked to Alzheimer's disease, well, there's the strength of the association, the consistency across different types of studies, the fact that the dietary changes preceded the risk of dementia, the dose response, more meat linked to more risk, a bunch of plausible mechanisms. We know meat is a risk factor for other chronic diseases, but there's never been a randomized controlled trial to put it to the test. When you read reviews of the damaging effects of high-fat diets to the brain and cognition, a number of factors are proposed to account for the high-fat diet-induced damage to the brain, oxidative stress, insulin resistance, inflammation, and changes to blood vessels of the integrity of the blood-brain barrier. But these are based mostly on studies of rodents. Yes, high-fat diets can cause energy dysfunction in the brain, based on fancy MRI techniques, but if you're looking at that thinking, that's so weird-looking brain, that's because those are rat brains. Let me show you two sets of human cerebral arteries, the arteries deep inside your skull. These are the brain arteries on autopsy of non-demented elderly individuals. Here are the arteries from Alzheimer's patients, clogged nearly completely shut with atherosclerotic plaque packed with fat and cholesterol. With CT scans, you can follow this intracranial artery stenosis, this brain artery clogging over time, and follow the progression from mild cognitive impairment to Alzheimer's disease. Those who only had low-grade stenosis were pretty stable over time in terms of their cognitive function and ability to dress themselves in other activities of daily living, whereas those with more clogging started slipping over the years, and those who started out with the most brain atherosclerosis rapidly went downhill, and twice as likely to progress to full-blown Alzheimer's. Chronic consumption of standard Western diets enriched in saturated fat and cholesterol may compromise our cerebrovascular integrity, compromise the blood vessels in our brain. Um, so, of course, drugs are recommended. Pharmacological modulation of diet-induced dysfunction, but why not just try to eat healthier in the first place? Okay, we're going to stop this here and uh, see if you have any questions. And uh, we may have some time to uh, go to nutritionfacts.org uh, and share with you uh, the resources and how you can look them up. Uh, but first, we want to see if you have any questions from the group. I have one. Hi. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, it's not related to this topic. So, like, you have some study section about sleep, like what what the best time to sleep, like the night or daytime? Because the reason I ask, because I'm a nurse in the hospital, but I'm a night nurse. A lot of people are told, like, night sleep, work the night, sleep the daytime is long run. It's not a benefit for your body. Basically, you should sleep uh night and get up daytime to do something i feel like oh i'm just curious how bad is it for your body <laughs> there's a research to do something i feel like maybe i need to transition to day shift later yeah so it's my take that um those people who are sleeping at night have uh increased incidence of illness and disease i can't give you a figure of how much uh, but if you enjoy your work and love what you're doing, that may be a counterbalance. Uh, and uh, you may be a freak of nature, is what I call some people who kind of beat the odds. 
uh, and live oh, in spite God. of their lifestyle. Scott, what's your take on on the sleep issue? Night. Yeah, I know. I've, yeah, I know. I've read some studies that show that. In general, of course, it's you know overall people probably with unhealthy lifestyles. There might be a lot of confounding variables, but there's a lot of people that you know that work at night and sleep during the day. They they have shorter lifespan, so that does seem to take light, uh, years off your life when you the longer you work night shift. So I know that's that's not good news for people that work night shift, but it has also has to do with the circadian rhythm and things like that. So. We're, you know, we're supposed to be sleepy when, when it's dark and be awake when it's light. But, but it, I would say, you know, if you had sleep, something like sleep apnea, that's even worse. And that was actually a statistic that relates to this. That's actually from the Alzheimer's solution. I have some notes from that and a statistic from that, from that book, it says sleep apnea increases the risk of Alzheimer's disease by 70%, 70, 70%. Ooh. So, so that's not good. So you're probably far as brain function and Alzheimer's, you're probably just as bad, if not worse off having sleep apnea than even if you work at night and sleep during the day. But as long as you're getting at least seven hours of sleep during the day, that was my problem when I used to work night shift years ago. I just was not a good daytime sleeper. I'd only maybe get three or four hours of sleep and uh, that would be about all I could do. And some people can sleep better during the day if they work at night and some people can't like myself. Yeah, it's kind of hard. Depends, yeah, I think. Ask for a lot more pay. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. you, deserve, you deserve it if you're working at night. Yeah, it's not long run, it's not helps with health. That's why I pay a little more for the day shift because it's just a sacrifice your body issues. But I exactly. think about it. <laughs> exactly. Good question. And we'll keep our eyes and ears open about the actual numbers. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Charlie? Yeah, go ahead, Mary. And then a run and then Jean. I just want to make a comment about the nighttime workers. You know, I had 100 employees for almost 40 years, and I was very interested for a long time on those nighttime workers because some of them did really, really well and seemed like it was normal and others were just a mess, couldn't do it at all. And what I discovered, this is no study or anything, but what I discovered is that the people who did really well with nights did nights the same way that we do days. You know, you get up in the morning and you have breakfast or whatever, and you go to work and then you come home and you have your social time. And before you go to bed, you know what I mean? You go to bed and you sleep your time and you get up. So if they mimic that on nights, you know, like um, when they get home from work, they don't go to bed right away. They, they have that social time like we have after work. And then they, then they go to bed and they're getting up at, you know, if they start work at 11, they're getting up at 10 and having what we would call breakfast. And, you know, they, they mimic the same kind of schedule. And those people seem to do super well for years, working nights and sleeping days. It's the people who try and stay awake during the day and you know, sleep a couple hours in the afternoon, and then think they're going to go to work again. That don't can't last long, and they wind up pretty sick. Just my personal experience yeah. of night workers. Yeah, and I think adding to that, like not switching back. Like I would always try to switch back on my days off, and yeah, you kind of have to just stay up all night, even on your days off, to make it to make it work. Probably. That's true. Yep. Good thoughts. A uh, run. Yeah, Charlie, I was thinking that if you work at night, chances are that during the daytime, you might drink a little bit more caffeine, maybe have a lot more sugar, maybe have less exercise, you know, and all of that probably adds up. That's my take on it. Good thought. I like it. Uh, Jean. So I want to go back to what you were saying in regards to sleep apnea and losing 70%, um, you, know, you know, going towards Alzheimer's. So would that still be the case if somebody uses a CPAP machine? Um, would the odds increase of, of um, not getting Alzheimer's um, as opposed to getting Alzheimer's uh, so significantly with 70%? In other words, the CPAP machine helped reverse that that terrible uh, factoid you gave us about Alzheimer's. 
Yeah, I would say yes, that would reverse that. So it's because there's so many people are untreated for that have obstructive sleep apnea, they're untreated, undetected. And so if you're if you're on a CPAP and you're and it's working appropriately, the settings are right and you're getting follow up and you're waking up feeling rested, I would I would say you would not have increased risk for Alzheimer's if you're properly treated. Thank you. So it has to do with uh, hereditary was I, uh, what I learned is that because my parents had sleep apnea, I have sleep apnea um, and that it's gone down the generational lines um, back, you know, several generations. So uh, even though there have been some really skinny people like runners who could run, you know, um, marathon runners and they could stop breathing for three minutes at a time, they have sleep apnea. They're not overweight. They're really skinny, but they have sleep apnea because they inherited from their parents, you know. So, so uh, it, uh, it initially I thought it was because people were overweight, but it's not just people who are overweight. And also, and children uh, apparently they have sleep apnea as well, and again inherited from their parents, and they struggle with with all kinds of learning disabilities. And it's not truly a learning disability if they use a CPAP machine at night. I'm sure that they would do much better during the daytime. Um, and they would only know that, but that's what I've learned from C uh, sleep apnea and using CPAP machines and, and how it is you end up with sleep apnea. Um, is, is that, would you concur with that? Uh, both you guys, doctors, Charles and Scott? Yes, uh, I've, I've, it's the vast majority are in overweight and, and people. And a lot of times when people change their diet and lifestyle and, and end up losing weight, their, C their sleep apnea goes away and they don't need a CPAP anymore. That's probably the, the biggest majority, but it's absolutely true what you're saying. There are lots of skinny people that also have sleep apnea and it, there is a hereditary component and it has to do with airway structure and having a kind of a floppy palate and different things. So there's a lot of, there's also central sleep apnea, which is different from, a, from a obstructive sleep apnea. And so there are lots of types and you're, you're absolutely right as far as uh, it's, not, it's not just people that are overweight, but that, that's probably, you know, the, the vast majority of people um, that have obstructive sleep apnea, it's, that's the, the cause, but. I agree with what Scott just said. Uh, I don't have anything particularly to add to that. You, uh, it is important that you see a sleep specialist, uh, you get evaluated appropriately, uh, and then you get treated and make sure that the treatment is working and keep at it. And you may be able to reduce it over time. You just kind of keep an eye on it and, and figure it out that way. Yeah, I, I use the CPAP machine re religiously. So I'm getting good quality sleep. I wake up, I feel re rested. So That's yeah, great. for me, it's good. working. Good deal. Uh, anyone else? We uh, have another TED talk that I wanna share with you. And that has to do with uh, things that you could do to prevent yourself from developing dementia. It's a pretty interesting TED talk. Uh, and so I'll go ahead and share that a run first, for, first you. Thank you. I just, I was late today coming in, uh, but I wonder if you mentioned anything about uh, if there is a correlation between drinking and Alzheimer or you know cognitive issues, drinking alcohol. Yeah. Um, I don't know about that, Scott. Do you know? I guess if you had too much alcohol to drink, but I haven't seen that as one of the major risk factors. Um, yeah, no. It's. I mean, it's it. it it's better to avoid it because it's definitely is not good as far as overall health goes, but it's more correlated with, with cancer. But, uh, but yeah, it's not one of the highlights of like, I'll look at like for the Alzheimer's solution, it's nutrition, exercise, unwind, restore, optimize. Um, but it's the four pathways to Alzheimer's oxidation, inflammation, glucose dysregulation, lipid dysregulation, but you know, alcohol is not going to be helpful when it comes to all those things. So, um, but I don't think they had they had anything specific on that. And alcohol is not particularly related to heart disease. If you looked at the vessels and the people who had dementia and the people who didn't, 
you'll see it's the same risk factors as heart disease, pretty much. So, okay. got it? Yeah, thank you. Good question, thank you. All good questions, actually. So here we go, one more TED Talk. And it is, um, what's the name of it? Why, what you can do to prevent. So we're, here it is, right here. How many people here would like to live to be at least 80 years old? Yeah. I think we all have this hopeful expectation of living into old age. Let's project out into the future, to your future yous, and let's imagine that we're all 85. Now, everyone look at two people. One of you probably has Alzheimer's disease. <laughs> All right, all right. <laughs> and, and maybe you're thinking, well, it won't be me. Then, okay, you are a caregiver. So, <laughs> in some way, this terrifying disease is likely to affect us all. Part of the fear around Alzheimer's stems from the sense that there's nothing we can do about it. Despite decades of research, we still have no disease-modifying treatment and no cure. So if we're lucky enough to live long enough, Alzheimer's appears to be our brain's destiny. But maybe it doesn't have to be. What if I told you we could change these statistics, literally change our brain's destiny, without relying on a cure or advancements in medicine? Let's begin by looking at what we currently understand about the neuroscience of Alzheimer's. Here's a picture of two neurons connecting. The point of connection, this space circled in red, is called a synapse. The synapse is where neurotransmitters are released. This is where signals are transmitted, where communication happens. This is where we think, feel, see, hear, desire and remember. And the synapse is where Alzheimer's happens. Let's zoom in on the synapse and look at a cartoon representation of what's going on. During the business of communicating information, in addition to releasing neurotransmitters like glutamate into the synapse, neurons also release a small peptide called amyloid beta. Normally, amyloid beta is cleared away and metabolized by microglia, the janitor cells of our brains. While the molecular causes of Alzheimer's are still debated, most neuroscientists believe that the disease begins when amyloid beta begins to accumulate. Too much is released, or not enough is cleared away, and the synapse begins to pile up with amyloid beta. And when this happens, it binds to itself, forming sticky aggregates called amyloid plaques. How many people here are 40 years old or older? Yeah, you're afraid to admit it now. Um, <laughs> This initial step into the disease, this presence of amyloid plaques accumulating, can already be found in your brains. Now, the only way we could be sure of this would be through a PET scan, because at this point, you are blissfully unaware. You're not showing any impairments in memory, language or cognition. Yet. We think it takes at least 15 to 20 years of amyloid plaque accumulation before it reaches a tipping point then triggering a molecular cascade that causes the clinical symptoms of the disease. Prior to the tipping point, your lapses in memory might include things like, why did I come in this room? Or, oh, what's his name? Or, where did I put my keys? Yeah, now, before you all start freaking out again, because I know half of you did at least one of those in the last 24 hours, these are all normal kinds of forgetting. In fact, I would argue that these examples might not even involve your memory because you didn't pay attention to where you put your keys in the first place. After the tipping point, the glitches in memory, language and cognition are different. Instead of eventually finding your keys in your coat pocket or on the table by the door, you find them in the refrigerator. Or you find them and you think, what are these for? 
Okay, so what happens when amyloid plaques accumulate to this tipping point? Our microglia janitor cells become hyperactivated, releasing chemicals that cause inflammation and cellular damage. We think they might actually start clearing away the synapses themselves. A crucial neural transport protein called tau becomes hyperphosphorylated and twists itself into something called tangles, which choke off the neurons from the inside. By mid-stage Alzheimer's, we have massive inflammation and tangles, an all-out war at the synapse and cell death. So, if you were a scientist trying to cure this disease, at what point would you ideally want to intervene? Many scientists are betting big on the simplest solution: keep amyloid plaques from reaching that tipping point. Which means that drug discovery is largely focused on developing a compound that will prevent, eliminate, or reduce amyloid plaque accumulation. And so, the cure for Alzheimer's will likely be a preventative medicine. We're going to have to take this pill before we reach that tipping point, before the cascade is triggered. Before we start leaving our keys in the refrigerator, we think this is why, to date, these kinds of drugs have failed in clinical trials. Not because the science wasn't sound, but because the people in these trials were already symptomatic. It was too late. Think of amyloid plaques as a lit match. At the tipping point, the match sets fire to the forest. Once the forest is ablaze, it doesn't do any good to blow out the match. You have to blow out the match before the forest catches fire. Even before scientists sort this out, this information is actually really good news for us because it turns out that the way we live can influence the accumulation of amyloid plaques, and so there are things we can do to keep us from reaching that tipping point. Let's picture your risk of Alzheimer's as a seesaw scale. We're going to pile risk factors on one arm, and when that arm hits the floor, you are symptomatic and diagnosed with Alzheimer's. Let's imagine you're 50 years old. You're not a spring chicken anymore, so you've accumulated some amyloid plaques with age. Your scale has tipped a little bit. Now let's look at your DNA. We've all inherited our genes from our moms and our dads. Some of these genes will increase our risk, and some will decrease it. If you're like Alice and still Alice, you've inherited a rare genetic mutation that cranks out amyloid beta, and this alone will tip your scale arm to the ground. But for most of us, the genes we inherit will only tip the arm a bit. For example, APOE4 is a gene variant that increases amyloid, but you can inherit a copy of APOE4 from mom and dad and still never get Alzheimer's. Which means that for most of us, our DNA alone does not determine whether we get Alzheimer's. So what does? We can't do anything about getting older or the genes we've inherited. So far, we haven't changed our brain's destiny. What about sleep? In slow-wave deep sleep, our glial cells rinse cerebral spinal fluid throughout our brains, clearing away metabolic waste that accumulated in our synapses while we were awake. Deep sleep is like a power cleanse for the brain. But what happens if you shortchange yourself on sleep? Many scientists believe that poor sleep hygiene might actually be a predictor of Alzheimer's. A single night of sleep deprivation leads to an increase in amyloid beta, and amyloid accumulation has been shown to disrupt sleep, which in turn causes more amyloid to accumulate. And so now we have this positive feedback loop that's going to accelerate the tipping of that scale. What else? Cardiovascular health, high blood pressure, diabetes, obesity, smoking, high cholesterol have all been shown to increase our risk of developing Alzheimer's. Some autopsy studies have shown that as many as 80 percent of people with Alzheimer's also had cardiovascular disease. Aerobic exercise has been shown in many studies to decrease amyloid beta in animal models of the disease. So, a heart-healthy Mediterranean lifestyle and diet can help to counter the tipping of the scale. Okay, so there are many things we can do to prevent or delay the onset of Alzheimer's, but let's say you haven't done any of them. Let's say you're 65. There's Alzheimer's in your family, so you've likely inherited a gene or two that tips your scale arm a bit. You've been burning the candle at both ends for years. You love bacon, and you don't run unless someone's chasing you. 
Let's imagine that your amyloid plaques have reached that tipping point. Your scale arm has crashed to the floor. You've tripped the cascade, setting fire to the forest, causing inflammation, tangles, and cell death. You should be symptomatic for Alzheimer's. You should be having trouble finding words and keys and remembering what I said at the beginning of this talk. But you might not be. There's one more thing you can do to protect yourself from experiencing the symptoms of Alzheimer's, even if you have the full-blown disease pathology ablaze in your brain. It has to do with neuroplasticity and cognitive reserve. Remember, the experience of having Alzheimer's is ultimately a result of losing synapses. The average brain has over 100 trillion synapses, which is fantastic. We've got a lot to work with. And this isn't a static number. We gain and lose synapses all the time through a process called neuroplasticity. Every time we learn something new, we are creating and strengthening new neural connections, new synapses. In the NUN study, 678 nuns all over the age of 75 when the study began were followed for more than two decades. They were regularly given physical checkups and cognitive tests, and when they died, their brains were all donated for autopsy. In some of these brains, scientists discovered something surprising. Despite the presence of plaques and tangles and brain shrinkage, what appeared to be unquestionable Alzheimer's, the nuns who had belonged to these brains showed no signs of having the disease while they were alive. How can this be? We think it's because these nuns had a high level of cognitive reserve, which is a way of saying that they had more functional synapses. People who have more years of formal education, who have a high degree of literacy, who engage regularly in mentally stimulating activities, all have more cognitive reserve. They have an abundance and a redundancy in neural connections. So even if they have a disease like Alzheimer's compromising some of their synapses, they've got many extra backup connections, and this buffers them from noticing that anything is amiss. Let's imagine a simplified example. Let's say you only know one thing about a subject. Let's say it's about me. You know that Lisa Genova wrote Still Alice, and that's the only thing you know about me. You have that single neural connection, that one synapse. Now imagine you have Alzheimer's. You have plaques and tangles and inflammation and microglia devouring that synapse. Now when someone asks you, hey, who wrote Still Alice? You can't remember, because that synapse is either failing or gone. You've forgotten me forever. But what if you had learned more about me? Let's say you learn four things about me. Now imagine you have Alzheimer's and three of those synapses are damaged or destroyed. You still have a way to detour the wreckage. You can still remember my name. So we can be resilient to the presence of Alzheimer's pathology through the recruitment of yet undamaged pathways. And we create these pathways, this cognitive reserve, by learning new things. Now, ideally, we want these new things to be as rich in meaning as possible, recruiting sight and sound and associations and emotion. So this really doesn't mean doing crossword puzzles. You don't want to simply retrieve information you've already learned, because this is like traveling down old, familiar streets, cruising neighborhoods you already know. You want to pave new neural roads, Building an Alzheimer's-resistant brain means learning to speak Italian, meeting new friends, reading a book, or listening to a great TED Talk. And if, despite all of this, you are someday diagnosed with Alzheimer's, there are three lessons I've learned from my grandmother and the dozens of people I've come to know living with this disease. Diagnosis doesn't mean you're dying tomorrow. Keep living. You won't lose your emotional memory. You'll still be able to understand love and joy. You might not remember what I said five minutes ago, but you'll remember how I made you feel. And you are more than what you can remember. Thank you. That's a good one, wasn't it? Huh? That's a good, good video. It really is. Uh, I'm inspired. I thought, you know, I need to go back and learn some more Spanish. And 
and uh, you know, stretch my brain a little bit more. I'm reading every day, but maybe I need to add a little something to it. I hope that was kind of uh, interesting, inspiring, not too technical for most of you. Um, hope it uh, inspired you to keep going and and uh, keep improving yourself. Yes, a run. Uh, I wanted to second you. I think I have heard somewhere else as well that if you know two or three or four or five languages, it really helps. <laughs> but I have also heard that bicycling, even on a stationary bicycle and dancing and music, they all seem to help in, in this issue, yeah. Yeah, so exercise is going to be helpful for sure. Dancing, you're learning new things and you're moving. So that would have uh, very good effects. Uh, in fact, my dad was dancing and singing, playing an accordion till he was 99 and a half. So uh, it seemed to work for him. Yeah, playing a musical instrument is a big one because it's you're, you're using emotion, you're using motor function, you're um, you know, memory for musical notes or reading music. So there's a lot of, hits a lot of parts of the brain. So so hopefully that's what you guys picked up from that last video, even kind of in addition to some of the stuff that was repetitive from maybe some of the previous videos is that functional reserve, having that reserve and, you know, having a meaningful conversation and with, with a friend and those kinds of things, not being, you know, isolated and introverted at, at, at our homes. We want to get out. That's why the blue zone people, they not only live to be a hundred, but they have very little, if any, dementia because they're very connected with their family and their friends and they have a lot of purpose in their life and and as well as the exercise and the dietary components and whatnot. So uh, hopefully you picked up that from that last video. Well, I wanted to add, I have a good friend who has Alzheimer's and he is from Germany, but he was bilingual, you know, actually trilingual. So now with his advanced uh, diagnosis, he only speaks in German 90% of the times. So I wonder why, yeah. Well, that was his first language, I guess. And right. Uh, right. maybe he's got the most neural connections with that. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's also, and also really important to be able to hear uh, really well. So I always tell patients that because there's there's studies that are very strong that show that if you are not hearing well and you're reluctant to to wear a hearing aid, you're missing out on conversations because of hearing loss. You really need to get the hearing aid because that increases your risk of developing dementia and Alzheimer's if you uh, are hearing impaired and you don't treat it properly. Dave, and I think yeah. wearing well, hearing aids also works to help prevent depression because when people can't hear, they socially isolate and higher incidence of depression and untreated hearing loss do. So, and I think a lot of people don't wanna have hearing aids because they think it will make them seem old, but the re reality is that our hearing goes down as we age anyway, and uh, we have fabulous technology. I've worn hearing aids for 15 years. Uh, my dad had a hearing loss and I didn't realize how much I was missing until I got my hearing aid. So if any of you are thinking you might have a hearing loss, it definitely makes a difference. So please, I I don't get any kickback either, but I really, the kickback you get is quality of life. So please consider that. Thank you. Dave. Yeah, um, Arun brought up music and it reminded me I watched a few years back there's a uh, Glenn Campbell, it got Alzheimer's, the musician, and he did uh, basically a farewell tour while he had Alzheimer's. And it just talks about how he could still do his music, even though he couldn't do some simple things in everyday life. Mm -hmm. And it, it was just a, it, it was a pretty moving movie if you get, you can find it somewhere on the internet. Um, I, I thought it was really good. My dad had Alzheimer's and I, helped him through his last year and uh, it's a lot yeah also tony curtis tony curtis did a farewell concert with lady gaga and he had really bad alzheimer's and but he could still remember all the songs they did yeah. a concert and that, that was, they tom replayed bennett. it not long ago 
Oh, I'm sorry, not Tony Curtis, Tony Bennett. Yeah, thanks for correcting me. <laughs> one was an actor, one was a musician. Yeah, she was a musician. Yeah. Tony Bennett, right. Spectacular. Thank you. Yeah. Well, um, we hope we've stretched your brain a little bit tonight, that you've learned a few things, uh, maybe developed a few new neural connections. And... Uh, Next week, um, I think the topic's going to be what? Food label reading, and inst instead of me doing it, I'm going to have uh, dietitian Sean Egglestone's going to going to present the food label reading uh, class one week from tonight. So, special guest. Great, excited for that, Gene. Yes, uh, last week was my first time, and. From our discussion last week, I did check out the video from last year uh, from one of the class periods, and um, uh, it was on chronic kidney disease. And what I learned was that uh, the whole foods plant-based diet will help to reverse uh, uh, chronic kidney disease. However, I haven't experienced that. I've been uh, on whole foods plant-based diet now for three and a half years. And it's done nothing to um, reverse uh, chronic kidney disease. So I had an, um, I I uh, went for a test uh, this morning, uh, um, ultrasound to see what's going on with my kidneys because it could be more genetic rather than um, chronic kidney disease. And it because um, the because don't know why the whole foods plant based diet did not work. Well, uh, when I interview people who it does not seem to be working for, I oftentimes uh, hear some foods that are like um, oils, uh, refined oils, or um, either in salad dressings or in cooking that are plants, but um, are contributing factors. I sometimes hear other kind of processed foods. So are you eating totally whole plant foods, unprocessed, um, and um, uh, not eating foods that are high in fat content? I cannot digest oil, so I don't consume oil at all. Not uh -huh. on salad dressing, not for cooking, nothing. And I don't eat that much uh, processed foods because um, I want to limit my salt intake. So I really stand by no SOS, no salt, oil, or sugar, and not not a hundred percent, but ninety five percent. And so, um, again, I need to figure out uh, why um, the whole foods plant based diet is not doing its thing to reverse uh, kidney disease. So, um, it could be a different um, issue, maybe genetic, since my paternal grandfather died of it when my father was a a boy of five years old. So the only people who I've seen actually reverse their kidney disease are people who have done this, not 95%, but 100%. They don't okay. go out and eat. Uh, they don't eat food that other people bring them. They eat whole plant foods as they're grown in nature. And um, uh, it is, uh, they're following Esselstyn's kind of program where no avocados, uh, no olives, uh, because of the high fat content, even though they're generally considered healthy foods and uh, the fats that they have from nuts and seeds are uh, less than 150 calories, which is a quarter of a cup maximum of, of uh, nuts and seeds in their diet on a daily basis. So if you're, I, I guess I would encourage you for a six months period to, um, you know, follow what Esselstyn recommended to reverse his heart disease patients. Uh, I know my wife and I did that for two full years. Um, it turned out not to be a burden. At first, it was a little difficult and rough. Uh, we weren't used to it. And uh, after a couple of years, we were able to transition back uh, to some of the avocado occasionally and some olives, but we were very, very strict because we wanted to reverse the heart disease that uh, we had been building up during that our our life. Well, thank and you that, for that. I, I will try to be more diligent about by 100%. And, and that being said, there are still- to the class. Go ahead, Scott. Yeah, 
And that being said, there are still, you know, check, you know, follow up with your provider too, because there are autoimmune causes, there's Stills disease, IgA nephropathy, there's, there's other causes of, of uh, kidney disease other than just diet and lifestyle. So, um, but all of, a lot of those could be influenced by diet and lifestyle in a, in a positive way. But so, yeah, biggest thing would be yeah, not getting any animal protein, you know, high processed foods, oil, salt sugars, things like that. And then being a norm, being of normal weight and everything else, the ideal weight, because just e having extra body fat on our bodies is can be harder on the kidneys. And then there's other things too, like ibuprofen and other medications that can cause stress to the kidneys. So there's, there are a lot of other, th other factors that influence it. And if you're having any questions, you want to talk one-on-one, -on -one, we're more than willing to do that. Just send us a note and be happy to, you know, spend some time with you on the phone to discuss, well, what about this and what about that? Go ahead, Dottie. I was trying to remember in um, um, How Not to Die, but I, I do remember them, him talking about like toxins that get into the liver. And if you have too much in your liver, that it can spill over into your kidneys too, right? So I'm wondering if toxins... You know, we talked about chelation earlier, if that kind of thing could be a factor too in what Gene was saying. It just made me think everything, it's kind of whatever is in our body, it's all related, isn't it? So just a thought I had, and I was just wondering if there were comments about that from you guys. I would say those are reasonable comments and, you know, it uh, can be complicated to figure out <laughs> what people are getting, but by looking at the dietary choices and really maximizing them to eating only healthy choices, that can give you your best chance of clearing out those toxins, which can lead to inflammation and cause uh, kidney problems, heart trouble, diabetes, and all the other chronic illnesses that we have. So, um, But I think yeah. a lot of toxins can be environmental, our cleaners, our, our soaps and other things, not just food, because sounds like Jean's really getting a handle on the food stuff and has been so maybe other toxins, you know. Well, if, if Jean yeah, had said, I'm doing this 100%, then I would say, yes, I would start looking at those other issues. But if uh, I would encourage anyone who is not doing this 100% to do it 100% for at least, you know, four to six months and give your body a real chance at success, uh, and then if for some reason it's not working, uh, follow up. Now, you could keep pursuing these other issues. And as Scott says, you know, there are autoimmune conditions that can cause this, but those oftentimes can be improved by, uh, you know, if you listen to Brooke Goldner, you know, she reversed her autoimmune disorder by doing this 100%. Um, and so um, I just... I may sound like a broken record, but if I hadn't done it myself 100% and know that it can be done, and if I hadn't, I don't, if I knew, you know, when I first started this 11 years ago, I kind of thought, geez, what's the sense in living if you can't eat what you enjoy? Well, I love what I am eating right now. It's totally whole food plant-based. My tongue is, uh, taste buds have changed. And I encourage others to think that maybe this isn't such a trauma that maybe reaching for your health by just picking healthy foods can actually bring you joy in your life uh, that you didn't expect could happen. All right, it's 8.40, we've gone an hour and 40 minutes. <laughs> well, we had an important part of little conversation here at the end. Yeah. Uh, we do look forward. We're happy to have all of you here, and we look forward to uh, next week. Scott, thank you. And yeah. uh, uh, we're looking forward to Sean Eggleston next week uh, and his talk. And uh, if you have anything else to add, we're here for another minute. Looks like Jan Lee, you have something you want to say. No, I want to say thank you. <laughs> okay. You're very welcome. Thank you.
Okay. Thanks, Scott and everybody else. See you next week. Take care, everyone. All right.